Good morning, everyone. Oh, that was a nice and very rousing good morning. Uh, where do I need to move over here? Oh, my goodness, they say the camera adds, what, 20 pounds? I think it just added about 100. Anyway, I uh, feel so sinful up here wearing a T-shirt and, and pants like this, but it is our work day, so we announced it for several weeks, and thank you to everybody who was able to, uh, to wear uh, work clothes. But we especially admire those of you who are dressed up. You look nice. And if anybody wants to preach today because they're wearing a tie or whatever, feel free to do so. I'm uh, happy to see, uh, I don't want to draw too much attention to her because she's finding a seat, but Marilyn Bowman, so good to see you. After spending many, many weeks in uh, caregiving and continuing to be a caregiver, we want to definitely keep Marilyn in our prayers and, and so good to have you here in worship today. Um, I don't know of any birthdays or anniversaries. Am I missing any? Does anybody have a... Sam's on Tuesday. I, well, I apologize. So that's, that's very kind of you. And how is Sam? <laughs> okay. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, actually, we can say Sam and Sam this week on Tuesday, St. Patrick today, perhaps. Uh, Paul? Oh, Okay. You just had that look. Okay, no problem. Okay. Well, let's uh, sing happy birthday to Sam. All righty. All right, yes, and uh, that day is approaching for the babies to be born, but not today, at least, at least as far as we know. Okay. Okay, there we go. It's so good to have you with us today, Tanner, of course, as always. And I do have some other happy news. I'd like to ask Betty Sutter, if you would, Becky, sorry, Becky Sutter, if you would mind, just to stand and let everybody see your face, if you don't mind. We have our newest church member, Becky Sutter. We'll give you, a give you a chance afterwards to, to shake her hand and, and give her the right hand of fellowship. So we're so grateful to, to add you to our church family officially. And now on to the announcements. The announcements are, oh, it's Jim? Okay, now there's two people right here in front of me that are on TV all the time. You're referring to the Japanese dive bomber over here? Okay, Alan Armstrong was on CNN Friday night, so you can go back and check it out. It was about this. Yeah, okay. So uh, anyway, as a fellow pilot, Jim is very enthusiastic about that, so uh, thank you. Now, on to the regular announcements. Uh, we have the usual networks, of course. We continue to uh, bring non-perishable food items to uh, support the local need in the community, as well as blankets, coats, and sleeping bags gently used or new for the work of the homeless downtown. Always willing to receive and accept them as you are able to bring them. Next slide, please. Uh, we do want to bring some attention to a community event, which is this Wednesday at 9 a.m., and that is Coffee with a Cop. It's going to be right down the road here at Einstein uh, Brothers, where they have, of course, the bagels and coffee, and it's uh, a caribou also. I guess it's called Einstein, but anyway, it's uh, the caribou place over there in front of Sprouts. And uh, I encourage you to go and, and meet the cops and, and hear something a little bit about them. They're not going to give you any kind of a sales pitch or anything. They're just going to give you a free cup of coffee or whatever and, and let you meet them. And if you have questions, you can do that but it's a great way to learn more about the community. As is Tucker Day on May the 4th, which is a great opportunity for us to get out there. We'll have our booth. We have a new section this year in Tucker Day, and it was named, actually Ann came up with the name for it. It's called Tucker United. And in this area of Tucker Day, we're going to have uh, all of the nonprofits and the churches in one location, and it's sort of to feature the uh, 
the religious side and the nonprofit volunteer pro social side of Tucker. So it's an opportunity for us to be out there, to let people know that we're here, let them know who we are, uh, show them the warmth and love that you experience here in church. And I think last year they estimated that there were nearly 5,000 people who came through Tucker Day. So it would be a great opportunity to uh, really witness for the sake of this congregation. Uh, oh, there will be a sign-up list out in the narthex, but we have several shifts. We have a setup crew, we have a morning shift, an afternoon shift, and an a end-of-the-day shift. It's, it runs basically from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, but of course setup will be between 7 and 7.30, and then takedown will be at 4 o'clock. Anyway, we'll talk more about that in the very near future. Next slide, please. Uh, math continues to be part of our ministry and outreach, and Kirk had uh, uh, four people, actually, including himself, uh, a grandmother and two students today who needed some help with math, and I heard very positive reviews of that. Now, uh, Jesus said that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like a little child. So therefore, now we're welcoming any of you adults who want to come on Saturday at 10 a.m. To, uh, to meet with Kirk to play math games, which, of course, will help you learn uh, some very good math skills. What? No air quotes? Oh, I am, so, I am so sorry. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Uh, tomorrow, we will have uh, our quarterly blood drive. There is also a sign-up in the narthex right now for people who would like to come and volunteer. And basically what you do is you stand in the narthex, and when people come in and they're looking around like, I don't know where I am or where I'm going, you simply say, are you here for the blood drive? And it's down the hall, and take a right, and so forth. And it's just, again, another way to meet people in the community, to thank them for what they're doing, which, is, of course, is donating blood. And, of course, uh, let them see your smiling face as they come into our building. Uh, it's from 2.30 to 7.30 p.m. And usually Pete comes and they get something out of him that's akin to Superman's blood. I don't remember what they call it, but something with an A in it. Power, power, power red. Hmm, sounds like a drink. And then, of course, uh, we have some advertisements here. FODAC, everybody knows, Friends of Disabled Adults and Children, which is a wonderful, uh, I say ministry, although it's really kind of, it's an LLC, I believe, or it's a 501c3. Uh, most of you know what that is, but in case someone here doesn't know or someone watching online doesn't know, FODAC is an organization that collects new and gently used donated medical equipment and so forth, and then they make it available, they, they sanitize it, they... Uh, make it available, and basically all you have to do is come and fill out an application, pay a $25 fee, and whatever you need, if it's a $3,000 motorized chair, if it's a hospital bed, if it's, a, you know, many other things, they give it to you at no additional cost, and you only pay the application fee one time. They're so large that they are opening a second warehouse in Savannah, and then they send uh, truckloads of stuff to places like Haiti and Puerto Rico. They've sent stuff to the Ukraine. They've sent stuff to India. They are that large, and they're right here in Tucker. So we want to help them as much as we can. They have a walk, run, walk, and roll with us at Stone Mountain Park. $35 gets you into that, and of course it's a fundraiser for them. It's worth doing if you have the time. Next slide, please. At the end of next month, uh, the regional assembly, the information will be available outside, and we'll put more of this in the uh, newsletter. But basically, this is our opportunity to meet with other disciples of Christ churches around uh, Georgia, see what our brothers and sisters in this denomination are up to, and have a, a nice convocation of worship and, and so forth. So we'll talk more about that, but I encourage you to consider going on Saturday. There's a men's luncheon, there's a women's luncheon. Now, i got to tell you, the women's luncheon is to die for, and uh, you, got, you ladies really want to go. The men's luncheon is going to be great, but, you know, men, we, you know, we're like chicken tenders and fries and coleslaw and stuff. Who knows? But anyway, it'll be a great time. Next slide, please. 
Well, today, of course, uh, we are going to have our work day. That's why I'm dressed like a contemporary preacher and not like my usual tie and suit guy. But uh, after worship, we'll have lunch, and then we're going to go and do some massive cleaning in the nursery, get it ready for those twins who should be with us any day now. And I know sooner is better. But we'll let, you know, we got next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview of the calendar, starting with today, of course, spring cleaning Sunday. Tomorrow, the blood drive. This week on Thursday, we have the elders meeting, the math workshop on Saturday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then two weeks from today is Easter Sunday, would you believe? It's like we just started Lent, and then we will be out of it in no time. Uh, and then, of course, I've already mentioned the Disciples of Regional Assembly. On April the 4th, the Nick Tucker Community Action Network meeting will be at Holy Cross uh, Catholic Church over on Shambly Tucker Road, and our uh, Steward Chair, Jonathan Clark, will be running that meeting, uh, and I encourage you to go that 10 o'clock. And of course, uh, just a reminder, I'm going to be on sabbatical in April. This is not a vacation. This is me stepping away from preaching and teaching and, and visitation. This is me getting into my nerd mode, reading books, writing stuff, uh, learning stuff, and coming back a month later, refreshed, rejuvenated, and with some more water in the well for, you know, for the for the duration. Sabbaticals typically happen every seven years, and uh, I've officially been here since November of 2016, which is just a little over seven years, so it's a good time to step back, get my bearings, and, uh, and, and then move forward. So I'm excited about that. So the question is, if we have a pastoral concern, if we have a need or whatever, guess what? We have another ordained minister on hand, and who also happens to be Reverend Edmondson, and she's sitting right over there. And she's going to be here, and she's going to handle your, your needs, okay? You also have the elders, and so everything's going to be fine. Don't worry, okay? And I'll have to be back. You also see we have a fine cadre of speakers. Uh, Dennis Bryan, who is our sexton, but also a military chaplain, is going to come and bring you a great message on the first Sunday. Then Kyle Ermoyan, who is our regional director of new church and church development, is going to be here. And then, of course, David Fisher from Networks is going to be here on the third Sunday of that month. And finally, the, the creme de la creme, the, the cherry on the top of the ice cream, is, of course, Tim Thompson will be uh, finishing us out in April. Next slide, please. Thank you to everyone who has volunteered, who has uh, come involved in some aspect. We've got people who are doing PowerPoints. And, of course, we still welcome more people who have that skill to join in if they like. But uh, another fine set of slides this week from Eden Clark. I think Jenna maybe has next week's slide. Am I right? Okay, wonderful. Uh, volunteers to come answer the phone. I know we had orientation training day last week. Sound booth. You see you got Jacob back there who is in charge. He's already kicked Jim out of the booth, which is great. And then, of course, uh, Beth, who is helping take all the donations to networks. And I just got to warn you, Beth, the mother of all donations is coming. Probably this week. Just to let you know. And, uh, of course, the PR team, we have some flyers out there, if you would, let people know what we're doing and so forth. Next uh, slide, please, our usual Wednesday activities. Uh, bells and Bible study at 6 p.m., choir at 7. And the final slide is just a thank you to whoever went to Publix for us today. I don't know who that was. Debbie? All right, Debbie Thompson, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, so be sure to go out there and get some goodies. And remember, after service, we have lunch in the fellowship hall. And after lunch, we're going to get busy making that nursery, nursery, sorry, you know how you put two words together because you're talking too fast? Nursery is going to sparkle when we're done. Now, let us put our hearts and minds into the mode of worship. Good morning, good morning, good morning. You know, I was uh, thinking each week we have a different weather pattern. <laughs> but the nice thing about it is that inside the house of God, we have infinite love. That's my prayer for today. Now, please join the choir, if you will. You can stand up. There'll be words and songs on the screen. 
And uh, what we're going to do is praise him, praise him. That's verses 1, 2, and 3. If you want to use your hymnal, it is number 93 page. So please stand. seated. And I have to say that if I was God, I would think that y'all are doing a good job of praising him. You sounded great. That's a compliment, y'all. You can take it. But as we come into our time of prayer, we all obviously want to be grateful and praise our Heavenly Father for the many wonderful blessings and gifts that God has given us. Even the gifts that we don't like, you know, the ones where we learn our deepest lessons, maybe through pain or suffering or struggles, and yet we find that in each of our experiences there is something to praise God for. Today I want to just remind you uh, again, grateful to see Marilyn with us today. She needs our prayers and our continued care and support. She is uh, a caregiver right now, and and she's been a caregiver all this time with, with her brother, for her mother, but now her brother as well, and so We appreciate your presence here today. We know that um, there are so many other things to be uh, mindful of, and I don't want anybody to feel conspicuous, but of course, we continue to pray for Marlo and Lester as as she grieves the loss of her son. Um, But of course, there is the hope of eternity that makes it a little easier, I'm sure. But we don't gloss over those things. We bring them before each other, we bring them to the Lord, and Together, we find peace and solace and support and strength. 
Finally, I'll mention that I uh, received a word that John Blakesley had a fall in uh, the tub, and I know that's a, not the most glorious thing to talk about, but the uh, paramedics should be on their way to come and help him. I did speak with him on the phone. He's quite lucid and just aggravated as he can be, and so please keep him in your prayers. But these are just a few things right now, and, and I know that represented in this room are many, many more cares and concerns. And so as we go before the throne of grace, even if your care or concern has not been mentioned, do know that God is aware, and I invite you to lift those up to him during this time as we pray together. So would you please join me now as we pray. In this sacred space, in this moment of stillness, our thoughts in silence our prayers are like incense rising to heaven. Father and maker of all, you adorn all creation with splendor and beauty and fashion human lives in your image and likeness. The beauty and dignity of human life was the crowning of your creation. You further ennobled that life when your son became one with us in his incarnation. Awaken in every heart reverence for the work of your hands and renew among your people a readiness to nurture and sustain your precious gift of life. Help us to value each person created in love by you. In your mercy, guide and assist us in our efforts to promote the dignity and value of all human life, born and unborn. Instill in us a respect for all life. Empower us to work for justice for the poor. Nourish us that we may bring food to the hungry. Inspire us to cherish the fragile life of the unborn. Strengthen us to bring comfort to the chronically ill. Teach us to treat the aging with dignity and respect. Bring us one day into the glory of everlasting life. And now, in this moment of gathered worship, we appeal to you as many parts of the one body of Christ, hear us as we each pray from the silence of our hearts. Gracious God, grant us the yoke of Christ, bind us together, tether us by your love, guide us with your presence, bring your kingdom into this world. It is for this kingdom that we now pray with the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will the deacons warmly greet you as they move into the aisle?
had some struggle with gifts, but their spirit is with you in this house. And with that blessing, we say amen. As we begin this preparation for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to repeat, as I often do, that if you are worshiping with us for the first time, we want you to know that we welcome you to the Lord's table. There are no qualifications that you have to uh, pass in order to partake of the Lord's Supper with us, except, of course, you've got to be breathing, and otherwise, we believe that the table is open, and Christ has welcomed everyone to the table. And so what Christ has joined together, let the church not separate, if I may say it that way. In John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus said that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This bread before us is the result of seeds that fell to the earth, and was reborn as stalks of grain. Then they died again to be reborn as bread. The cup comes from seeds that were also buried and reborn as grapes, and then crushed, and then reborn as drink. They are, of course, symbols of the death of our Christ to overcome sin and death for us, but they also serve to remind us as Jesus did in the gospel, that we too must follow him in the giving up of life 
that might have been for the life in Christ that we are called to live. So as we come to partake of the Lord's Supper, as we remember his death, burial, and resurrection, let us also remember that that includes our future death, burial, and resurrection. And now for the words of institution. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we pray as we come before your table that you will bless us all as we partake of, of the Lord's Supper. The blood of Christ is upon us as we share in this sacrament in purifying our souls. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Jeremiah 3, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be 
their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequities and remember their sin no more. That's from the book of the Lord, House of the Lord. That was beautiful choir, and I have to say that that particular song has a special meaning to me, which I'll come back to in a second. It reminded me, though, last Sunday, I mentioned that without any pre-planning on our part, uh, this, the hymn that, or the anthem that the choir sang last week was, As the Deer, okay? And I said, 
I would really be impressed with anybody who could find the connection to one of the passages I quoted in the sermon last week. You know, and I, I don't know, that might have been a little bit too obscure uh, because uh, nobody said anything to me afterwards about it. So I'm just going to give you that look, that disapproving teacher look like, mm -hmm, didn't do your homework, right? But anyway, uh, the answer is Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, which in the Christian Bible are separated. In the Hebrew Bible, they are one psalm. But both of those things, as the deer pants for streams of living water, is the opening line in Psalm 42. But I mentioned about the countenance being fallen. Remember, I talked about looking down rather than looking up. And throughout Psalm 42 and 43, we have this refrain, Why so downcast, O my soul? Why is your spirit disquieted, or why is my spirit disquieted within me? Hope in God, you see. And that was the connection. We didn't plan that, but it happened that way. So now, the choir sings a song which is very meaningful to us as ministers because it's, it's about the potter's hand, and perhaps you remember this story from the Bible, maybe from Sunday school, where a certain prophet was sent to the potter's house, and the potter is making this clay pot, and it's looking pretty good, but it's not quite right, so what does he have to do? Smash it and start over. Smash it and start over. Work it, work it, work it until you get it just right. And that's what the potter's hand is all about. That's what ministry is like. And uh, it's probably why I need a sabbatical next month after all these years. I need to be smashed or... Anyway, let me mention the prophet. The prophet is Jeremiah. And the prophet Jeremiah is the passage that we read from today for today's message. And the theme that we get throughout Jeremiah's preaching, and I, it's, you know, it's hard to read without context, but Jeremiah is a powerful story simply because there was a man who suffered for his ministry a lot. And there's this constant use of metaphors in Jeremiah's prophecies about tearing down and rebuilding or uprooting and replanting. And here in this case, the clay pot that is, has to be smashed and, and re, uh, remade until it's just right. Today, uh, Joe read for us Jeremiah 31, chapter, verses 31 through 34, and Jeremiah 31, verse 31, is the only passage in the Old Testament that makes reference to a new covenant. Now, as Christians, we have our own idea of what that means, and in fact, we've talked about it when we had the Lord's Supper. We talked about this being the blood of a new covenant and so forth. But we have to make sure that we understand the distinction here. Jeremiah is not talking about the new covenant that, we're, that we were talking about. In Jeremiah 31, he was talking about a new covenant. <laughs> Specifically, he says, a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. So this, the reason I'm making a, this point is very simple. Sometimes as Christians, we read this passage and we think to ourselves, oh, he's referring to the coming of Jesus about 587 years later. So here's my question for you. If he's referring to Jesus who comes almost 600 years later, then what good is that for the people of Judah who have just seen the massive destruction of their city the Chaldeans, the Neo-Babylonians came in, destroyed their city, pulled down the walls, and the most shocking thing of all, they destroyed God's temple. It would be irresponsible to read this passage from nearly 600 years before the time of Christ and think that it had no meaning to those people who were facing such devastation. It'd be like me telling you that 500 years from now, in the year 2524, humans will be living on planet X thousands of light years away. It doesn't make any difference to us now, does it? Jeremiah 31, 31 says that this is a 
new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. So if we miss this point, we will misread the entire passage. In Jeremiah's day, the kings and religious leaders had strayed from the covenant. That's what we've been talking about all month, right? God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with the people of Israel. And because they accepted it, God gave them the law. Not the other way around, right? They accepted the covenant. God gave them the law. And we fast forward now. Well, let me back up. Last week we talked about how many times after the giving of the law, the people complained and grumbled and so forth, and they suffered for it. But we fast forward now to the time of Jeremiah in which they were established in their homeland, they had a temple, they had, you know, a king, and so forth, and yet they continuously strayed, worshiping other idols, bringing in other practices that are not prescribed in the covenant or in the law. And God had warned them for many generations against this. And the northern kingdom, after the split north and south, the northern kingdom had already been destroyed, and the prophetic response to that was because they did not remain faithful to the covenant. They did not keep the covenant. And despite that, in the southern kingdom of Judah, the same thing, over and over, repeated uh, disobedience, and then, you know, reform and disobedience and reform and so forth. And finally, the end of the covenant. Jeremiah had proclaimed this for, for many, many years. And finally, the Chaldeans, or the Neo-Babylonians, came under Nebuchadnezzar, pulled down the walls of the city, massacred large numbers of people, and destroyed the temple. What was left for them to hope for? What thanks did Jeremiah get for being right? Think about that question for a minute. <laughs> if you read Jeremiah, you'll see none. <laughs> Aside from enduring years of ridicule, accusations of being unpatriotic, can you believe that preachers can be called unpatriotic from time to time? He had been beaten many times. Once he was thrown into a cistern that was filled with mud, and he was up to his neck in mud. Another time, he was locked up in stocks. The only thing I can imagine there is like the, you know, pilgrims and people being, held, you know, locked up in stocks and so forth. He was in an unenviable position. But his message of destruction had come true. Jerusalem and the surrounding territory had been ravaged by the Chaldeans. The walls of Jerusalem pulled down. The temple destroyed and it was even believed that during this time, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. And no, Indiana Jones did not discover it. No. But there would have been no Indiana Jones if it hadn't have disappeared. A large number of these survivors were chained together and marched off to Babylon, what we call the Babylonian exile, right? And among them was Jeremiah, until one of the Chaldean officials found him among the prisoners, and he released him. Why? Because Jeremiah had predicted that the Chaldeans would win, that they would destroy the city of Jerusalem and so forth. And so as far as they were concerned, he was on their side. But he wasn't. It made him look like a turncoat, but he wasn't. He had been telling the Judeans not to expect God to protect them until they had, as long as they refused to repent from their idolatry. Jeremiah was no turncoat, nor did he take pleasure in being right. He was simply a mouthpiece for God and faithfully delivered the message of a violated covenant. And like most prophets, as I have already said many times, he suffered for it. So with the end of the Jewish monarchy, the destruction of the temple, Many had cause for despair. To this, even to this, Jeremiah had a word of encouragement. 
this is not the end. God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. Now we take this and many other of such prophecies in the Old Testament and we can see in them the ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. But at that time, it had to mean something relevant to their lives in that moment. It was an immediate offer of grace from God to his devastated people, even though they had broken the covenant. He even mentions it there in verse uh, 33, right? Technically, their violation of the covenant releases God from his obligation to them. And that's a part that we tend to forget. God gives us a covenant, we agree, but if we disobey it, it really does not obligate God to continue. And we sometimes take that for granted. And that we can be as idolatrous as the ancient Judeans were in thinking that, hey, we've got God on our side. It don't matter what we do. But it does. Even so, we see God offering them grace in the form of a new covenant. In this covenant and in this statement, the emphasis is not on the word new and not on the word covenant but on the word heart. He will write their covenant, his covenant on their hearts. The word heart in the Hebrew Bible, like in, or sorry, the word heart, yeah, in the Hebrew Bible, just like in English, has many different meanings. And we use the word heart to talk about that, sh that box that we get candy in, right? We talk about the heart as being an organ that pumps blood throughout the body. And obviously what Jeremiah is talking about here is not God's going to write his covenant on the organ that pumps blood throughout the body. Here, the word heart refers to the conscience. We do this in English too, actually. We talk about our heart of hearts. Like, in my heart of hearts, I know. It's the same idea, the conscience. There is no word for conscience in biblical Hebrew, but the word for heart is used in this way. And here's an example, just one from 2 Samuel 24, 10. David was stricken to the heart because he had numbered the people. David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, I pray you, take away the guilt of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. What we don't see in this passage is a reference to any commandments that he had violated. Instead, we see how David's recognition of having done something wrong convicted his conscience. That's an interesting contrast, isn't it? The biblical phrase uh, being that he was stricken to the heart. Again, conscience. This is how the conscience acts as an inner law or a moral control or an inner sense, even when we do not have the commandments available to us. Going back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, I wondered to myself on a number of occasions if Viktor Frankl had this passage in mind when he made this statement in The Will to Meaning. In an age in which the Ten Commandments seem to lose their unconditional validity, man must learn more than ever to listen to the 10,000 commandments arising from the 10,000 unique situations of which life consists. And as to these commandments, he is referred to and must rely on his conscience. I will write my law, my covenant, upon their hearts. And here we have the concept that the conscience is higher than the written law because it confronts us with the rightness or the wrongness of any given situation, whereas written Commandments are limited. Just think about this for a minute. Can anybody remember how many commandments are actually given in the Hebrew Bible? I know that Pete is looking like, he, he knows the answer. And it's, it's up there. He's like, he's in jeopardy mode right now. He knows the answer. Okay, okay, I know. And when I say the number, you're going to say, I was going to say that, but I didn't want to. Right? 613. Okay, 613. But 
613 commandments are not enough. They are only representative of 613 possible situations out of thousands and thousands of possibilities that a person may encounter. Now, all of you who have ever taught school, you know, or you've done other kinds of work where you've had a manual, like here's the rule book or whatever. What do, the, what do the students do or what do the employees do? They look for those loopholes. Well, you said thou shalt not, you know, do this, but you, did you, you know, thou shalt not wear red, but you didn't say red socks. You know, they always look for that loophole. That's because 613 commandments are just representative. In the Will to Meaning, Frankel gives two personal examples of how he had to judge between the commandments. Both of, uh, both of them actually come from the Ten Commandments, as a matter of fact. The first example is when he was faced with the question of whether to accept his visa and immigrate from Austria to the United States. The Nazis had already taken over Nazi, uh, Austria, excuse me, and it was only a matter of time before all the Jews in, in Austria would have been deported since he was a uh, neurologist and the director of a hospital. He was not going to be taken away in the first wave, you see, but eventually they would have taken him. He and his wife could have taken that visa and come to the United States, but he knew that if he did, his parents and his brother would not survive. It was a dilemma for him. And one day while contemplating this dilemma, he saw a piece of marble, broken piece of marble that his father had brought home and left it on the table there. And it came from a nearby synagogue that had been destroyed by the Nazis. You've all heard of Kristallnacht, in which the Nazis burned and looted and destroyed a lot of, of um, synagogues. And so the, the big synagogue there in Vienna had been destroyed. And his father rescued a little piece of marble, and it had uh, a letter in Hebrew inscribed on it. And he asked his father, which one did it represent? And his father replied, honor your father and mother that you may live long in the land. And in that moment, Viktor Frankl knew he could not accept that visa and abandon his parents. The commandment represented the written law, but Frankel had to live in the moment of decision between obeying the commandment to honor father and mother or to preserve his own life, the life of his wife and the life of an unborn child. He made the free and responsible decision to give up his visa and to stay with his parents despite the danger of his conscience. Right? He obeyed his conscience, and he understood this as obeying the commandments. Unfortunately, he and his wife, his unborn child, his parents, and his brother were all taken by the Nazis. They went to Auschwitz, and all of them perished except for Victor, of course. But while he was there, he faced a conflict between two commandments. One was you shall not murder, and the other one was, you shall not commit adultery. He knew that many women in the concentration camps were basically put into a very compromising position to become sexually available to the camp guards. Frankel considered the possibility that his wife would be faced with this problem. If he insisted that she not violate the commandment against adultery, she would probably die. Would he be able to live knowing that she had died, preserving her chastity for his sake? His conscience said no. Wouldn't uh, this insistence on her chastity make him guilty of the thou shalt not kill commandment. It's a real tricky dilemma to be involved in. And he would know the whole time that it was for his own peace of mind that he had died, that she had died. He could not in good conscience let that happen. So he determined to tell her to do whatever she had to do to survive. 
Writing the law on the people's hearts is to say that the law is available to all people in all times and in all places. Now, in ancient Rome, there was a legal code called the Law of the Twelve Tables. I don't know if anybody ever heard of this before, the Law of the Twelve Tables. Guess how many tablets of law there were? Twelve, right? And they were displayed in the forum in Rome so that people could not say, I didn't know that was against the law. And be, you know, so as we like to say, ignorance is no excuse, right? But a law that is written on the heart is a higher law because we can't claim to be ignorant if we have a conscience. If we are presented with a circumstance in which we have to make a decision based on our conscience, we cannot say, oh, well, there's no law against it, right? Because we have that higher law. If the law is only external to us, it may be unknown to us, and we can claim that we acted in ignorance. That's why we had the students sign the paper saying, I have read the handbook, and I will obey it, right? But if the law is located within, we are always responsible. If we act against our conscience, what happens? We know it. We feel bad. And by the same token, if we follow our conscience, regardless of the circumstances, we feel justified. Therefore, a law of the heart or a conscience is an internal motivator rather than an external form of coercion. An external law tells us what we should do and what we have to do, but an internal law tells us what we ought to do. And an internal law, a conscience, can tell us what to do or help us to decide what to do in a situation for which there is no written law. Paul made the same point in his letter to the Romans when he talked about God's judgment on humanity, even those who didn't have the covenant. In chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, he wrote, When Gentiles, that's us, right, most of us, when Gentiles who do not possess the law by nature do what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. I know it's a little complicated language, but you know how these legal people are. They've got, they, they got to spell it out in every detail. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, as their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, judges the secret thoughts of all. Now, this answers the question that most people ask, how will God judge people who have never heard the gospel? right? It really does. Paul's answer is that they have a law written in their hearts. That is, they have a conscience, and God will judge accordingly. And in a real sense, every day, with every decision we make, we are already judged by our consciences, aren't we? We, we know when we violated that conscience. In addition to calling it a heart or a conscience, it has also been called things like the inner moral sense. And this is one of the points that C.S. Lewis makes in Mere Christianity. For those of you who are with us on Wednesday night, this ought to sound very, very familiar to you. Uh, in, in Mere Christianity, Lewis argued very effectively that people who deny this inner law often contradict themselves. Speaking about himself, my argument against God was that the universe seemed cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What, I, what was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction against it? If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, 
we should never have known it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. A law written on the heart is one that is motivated from within rather than from without. When we are motivated by this inner sense of the law, we choose our actions, or we should choose our actions accordingly, right? When we violate it, we feel it. When we are confronted with new and different situations, situations we have never encountered or prepared for even, We do so via the conscience, and hopefully the conscience educated by Scripture. There is no better better way to feel like we have followed the truth than when we obey our conscience. Am I right? Whether we follow the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, Jewish law, rabbinic law, or the example of Christ, and by the way, as Christians... We are told to follow the example of Christ, which I find much more difficult than simply trying to keep the law. Our behavior ultimately comes down to what we understand is the right thing to do. And no matter how cliche it sounds, the statement is still true, what would Jesus do? Among other things, the conscience is educated and shaped by a person's religious practice through prayer, through Bible study, through all kinds of other things that we do. It's also educated by the lack thereof. And people who don't have their consciences educated by Scripture often think and do things that are quite contrary to what we believe. This is why the commandments and the prophets are still relevant. This is why the Old Testament and the New Testament is very, still very meaningful to us. We read them to understand right from wrong. It's kind of like that old slogan. Remember the old slogan in the early days of computers? Garbage in, garbage out, right? You're going to get out of it what you put into it. What we dwell on, what we meditate becomes internalized. But as Christians, we have something, as I've said, even more demanding than just meditating on the commandments or the laws or whatever. We have the example of Christ. He modeled perfect obedience. We aspire to follow in his footsteps knowing that we will stumble and even stray from the path. The new covenant that Jeremiah announced to the people of Judah was, in a sense, that their devotion would no longer be dependent on such external things as a physical temple, a monarchy, or even a written law. This new covenant was to be written on their hearts, which means whether they're in Babylon or in Greece, or in South Africa, or in New York, or wherever they are, the law travels with them. Because it is written on the hearts, located within their consciences. This did not do away with what the written law says, because God's law is eternal, right? You shall not murder is still true. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind are still true. It only means that the location of responsibility for keeping the law is properly identified with each individual person. So, in these last two weeks of Lent, let us remain firm in our commitment to practice spiritual disciplines as we meditate on the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. Let us be reminded that the practice of spiritual disciplines, such as praying and meditation, fasting, are ways to train the body and the mind to follow the Spirit. Because it's not the body that says, I'm going to avoid eating today. And the mind may say, I would like to stop eating today, but I do need to survive. It's within our spirit that we say, there's something more important. The conscience is better than the written law because we carry it with us. It is an inner guide that God has given us to help us to distinguish between right and wrong. It can be followed or ignored, which means that we have both free will to make our own decisions, but also responsibility how we behave. That is our message for today. Our closing hymn today is verse 1 of hymn number 343. Jesus is calling thee home. I invite all who are able to stand as we sing this verse.
just a reminder that we have lunch available for all who are, would like to stay and help with the cleanup today. Uh, I do know that there is corned beef and cabbage there, which of course it wouldn't be St. Patty's Day without it, right? We also have, uh, I think, some chicken salad and some other things there uh, in case that's not your thing. But very special thanks to Honey Van de Creek who uh, has prepared it, and also to Gail who has prepared chicken salad and other things, and I think maybe some other people are involved back there. Long story short, stay and eat with us, okay? And then we're going to do some work in the, in the nursery. All right, so our closing blessing. As we journey with God through Lent, May we find the road that leads to life. May we take the turns that bring right relationships. And may we pause to accompany others along the way. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.